today's Teach Educational Round session. The topic for today is how to facilitate tobacco cessation groups and deal with challenging situations. And our faculty presenters are Carolyn and Stephanie. Now before I continue, I just want to make sure everyone can hear and see me clearly. If you could please type in the chat box. Okay, perfect. So I will continue. Now it is that time of year again where TEACH is putting together the curriculum for the next round of educational round sessions. And we want to hear from you. So let us know what type of topics you want us to cover for the 2016-17 year. And you can do so by clicking on the link right over here. So we ask that you please submit your responses by Friday, February the 12th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now if you are interested in obtaining a letter of completion for this round session, you must have first registered for the webinar and completed the pre-learning assessment. Next, you must have signed into the live webinar session using your first and last name so that we could track your attendance. And lastly, you must complete the evaluation and post-learning assessment following today's session, which will be emailed to you by 4 p.m. today. These webinars are being live tweeted through Twitter. Follow the CAMH Nicotine Dependent Services on Twitter at PS Quit Smoking. To follow the live tweeting or to post your questions or comments, use the following hashtag Twitter, sorry, hashtag Teach Webinar. Now your fir our first presenter today is Carolyn Platter. Carolyn is a clinical social worker with a specialization in mental health and addiction. She currently works in the emergency crisis team at both Toronto Western and Choi and Mississauga Hospitals. She's a part-time instructor at the Addiction and Mental Health Program at Durham College, and she also has a private practice with a focus on adolescent mental health and addiction. Carolyn has has an honors BA in psychology from York, addictions care worker diploma from McMaster, and a master's in social work from the University of Toronto. She is also a TEACH trained and a TEACH practice leader and is certified in ASSIST, certifying hundreds of individuals in evidence-based suicide prevention strategies every year. Her work in smoking cessation has been facilitating both research and clinical cessation groups and she has also sat on Curriculum Planning Committee for the Ontario Lung Association and CAMH, which has resulted in a toolkit for professionals working in respiratory care. Carolyn has published several papers in addictions and presented at various national and international conferences. Our second present presenter today is Stephanie Kirsta. She has over 10 years of diverse experience in community, hospital-based, and private practice in the fields of addiction, mental health, and disease prevention. She has completed extensive research and published in the area of motivation with addiction. She works as a consultant providing trainings and groups for a number of family health teams, community agencies, and public agencies. She's also the project manager for the Kuchiching Family Health Link, and additionally, she is a smoking cessation specialist at the Kuchiching Family Health Team and is part-time faculty at Durham College in their addiction and mental health program. She is also certified as trainer, certifying hundreds of individuals in evidence-based suicide prevention strategies every year. Her work in smoking cessation has been developing and facilitating clinical cessation groups. Stephanie graduated with an honors BSc in psychology from U of T and received her postgraduate certificate in addiction and mental health counseling, as well as a master's in psychology. Disclosures. There are no disclosures for our faculty presenters today. The TEACH curriculum and slides were developed and compiled with funding from the Government of Ontario, Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, and contents of the slides are primarily based on evidence-based guidelines from the following sources. These materials, as well as the verbal presentation and any discussion, set out only general principles and approaches to assessment and treatment and do not constitute clinical or other advice and do not replace the need for individualized clinical assessment and treatment plans. Now I'm just going to ask a few polling questions just to get a sense of our group today. 
So the first question is, what type of organization do you work for? Okay, great. So it looks like it's an even split between addiction agencies and public health units. The next question is, what discipline do you belong to? Okay, great. So it looks like today's group is predominantly addiction counselors and registered nurses. And the last question is, what region are you from? It looks like the majority from the GTA area. Thank you everyone for participating in the polls. And now I'm going to hand it over to Carolyn and Stephanie to take over for the rest of the presentation. Oh, ladies, don't forget to unmute your line. Push star one. Hello? Can perfect. you hear us now? Okay, perfect. So it sound, sound is okay? Yeah, okay, great. So welcome everyone. I'm Carolyn and this is Stephanie. So thank you very much, Tanya, for the introduction. Um, today we're going to be talking about starting a smoking cessation group. Um, and I just wanted to go to just sort of put it out there into the to those who are who are listening and who are watching. How many of you are running a smoking cessation group, or are you running your groups at your clinics or your agencies, or are you thinking about running a, a tobacco cessation group? And so I hope that through our presentation today, not only will you get a little bit of the background and some of the fundamentals about how to run a group, but we're also going to cover some of the curriculum, and then also, which is sort of the most fun part of our presentation, is really the final part where we talk about challenging situations. And I think for most of us, that's the stuff that we really want to know is how do you deal with the real life issues and problems and challenges that might arise in running a smoking cessation group. So first we wanted to start a little bit with the statistics. So again, stats are always important because it gives us a little bit of an indication as to why do we even need tobacco cessation groups in the first place. So many of you probably are familiar with some of these statistics. Um, but we do know that despite declining rates, we still have about 18.1% of the population do report being smokers. And then, of course, all of us know many of the negative uh, costs and consequences associated with smoking. And that's lung cancer, heart disease, stroke, COPD, and I mean, those are just to name a few. And lastly, we know that tobacco use is the major preventable cause of cancer. So, there's a significant need still that exists, um, and certainly we know that running groups can be an effective way to meet that need. So effectiveness of tobacco cessation groups. And this was always, when I was first doing my training, I never really thought of how effective a group would be on smoking cessation. And I generally always saw smoking cessation as a little bit more of an individualized um, thing that people just sort of decide on their own, they quit on their own. I never really thought of it as being a topic for a group. And it wasn't until I started actually running smoking cessation groups and doing some of the training that I realized how effective tobacco cessation groups really are. And we know when we look at the literature that chances of quitting are actually doubled um, when we compare that to self-help. So being in a group, just going into the group environment, actually increases chances of quitting. 
It also allows for social identification with non-smokers. So people who are more likely when they attend a group to start to identify with others in the group as non-smokers. And by identifying as a non-smoker, that also helps to assist with relapse prevention. It's one of the most effective interventions available. So when we actually start looking at the literature and reading the research out there, tobacco cessation groups actually has really um, effective, is quite effective um, in the literature. It can also be done in person, as we know, or new, which is a little bit more new, and we're seeing it kind of um, come out now in the literature, is that um, you can have smoking cessation groups over the internet. And this is a really interesting new area, a new area of tobacco cessation groups that's been coming out. Um, and a really good way, particularly in communities, um, or a little more rural communities, or where it's harder to kind of get everyone together into one common place, certainly being able to offer groups over the internet is a good, um, good option. And also additional benefits might include, of course, mutual support, so just being in a group with other quitters or people who are trying to quit. And for, from an agency perspective, certainly any time you run a group, it's a cost-effective measure. It's a good way to reach a lot of people in, in a relatively short time um, with not a lot of staff commitment. So those are just some of the effectiveness. And just looking through your responses, it looks like we have a lot of participants who are planning to run groups, but there's also a lot of people who are actually running groups currently. So we'd love to tap into your knowledge as we talk through this, uh, as we talk through this workshop, and hear what your thoughts are on this uh, on this topic. So now, just so this is our, sort of our agenda for the presentation today. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about the fundamentals. Uh, now, certainly for those of you who are already running groups, this might just be a little bit of a refresher. Um, and it's more just about sort of setting up some of the stuff behind the scenes before you actually start the group. Staff will talk about then the curriculum and the actual content. And this is where we're going to get more specific into actually running a tobacco cessation group, so the types of topics that you might go over, some of the resources that you might want to include. And then we're going to spend the last 20 minutes of the presentation addressing challenging situations. And we've come up with a few uh, scenarios and a few challenging clients that we might encounter into groups. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit, and this is where I really hope to hear from you all, um, about how you might address these situations and if you've gone through or had encountered some of these clients um, in your groups before. And then we'll also leave a little bit of time for some questions. So how do I begin? So the fundamentals, we're going to talk a little bit about facilitation. So are we going to talk about, are you going to have one facilitator or two? We'll talk a little bit about the type of group, when and where to hold your group, the cost and funding, recruitment, and then finally evaluation. So getting started, and a lot of people who are interested in running groups aren't really sure how do we actually get a group off the ground. And both Steph and I, in our previous employment, we were working at a group of methadone clinics, and we started smoking cessation groups from the ground up. So we were very familiar with what we needed to do first was conducting a needs assessment. So this is to figure out, do you actually need to have a tobacco cessation group at your agency, and will there be any benefit to people by offering a group? So what we did was a poll of how many of our clients actually smoke, and we also included on there whether how many were interested in having a tobacco cessation group and how many people were interested in quitting. So getting that information from your clients and also maybe from input from some other colleagues can really be helpful to see whether or not there is this need for it at your organization. We also assess stage of change too. So stage of change, did clients, were they contemplating making changes in their smoking behaviors? Were they ready to take some action? Was it even on their radar? So those are things that we really wanted to know before we launched into building our program. And we also wanted to know were clients willing and motivated to come to our group. Then you have to think about how are we going to facilitate the group? Who's going to actually run this group? So there are, are you going to have one facilitator or two? And there are some advantages, certainly, to having two facilitators, co-facilitators. Um, but certainly if your group grows larger, 
usually more than six to eight people, you're going to want to start including a second facilitator. You're also going to want to look at credentials and experience. Or have you ever run a group before? Do you feel comfortable to run a group? Maybe it is good to pair up with somebody else in your agency who's run a group before, um, just as a way of learning uh, for yourself. Also, the role of the facilitator. And this is really going to depend on the group. So are you going to be more active as a facilitator and take more of a psychoeducation, sort of a teaching role? Are you going to be less active um, and leave it more up to the group? Who's going to run it? Uh, some groups might even have peer leaders or peer facilitators also joining or taking part in the group. So that's something you want to consider as well. And lastly, dual relationships. And depending on the agencies, you may have pre-existing uh, relationships with some clients depending on what your role is. And just making sure you establish those boundaries at the outset um, prior to coming into the group. Next, we want to look at the type of group. So are you going to run an open group or are you going to run a closed group? So an open group means that it's fluid. So clients can come in and out. They might show up one week, then might not. There's no sort of start or stop date. Whereas a closed group, a closed group actually enrolls participants at the outset. And then those, let's say, eight participants go through a six, an eight, or a 12-week program together. And it is closed. Once week one has started, you don't take in any new clients or any new participants. And they'll have to wait until the next round um, if they would like to join. There's also a whole bunch of different types of groups that are offered out there. Is it going to be more of a support group? Do you want it to be more educational based? So again, as a facilitator, perhaps taking on more of a teaching role. Is it going to be a growth group, a therapy group, or even a self-help group? And this is where things like utilizing Alan Carr or those types of books or resources might be beneficial uh, in more of a self-help help type group. Is it mandatory or is it optional? And this is something that agencies can kind of go back and forth with. Um, so mandatory is that clients must attend the group. And there are some pros and sort of some cons associated with sort of forcing people to attend groups. Or is it optional? Is it up to them if they want to attend or not? And then lastly, you want to consider the population, right? Who are you going to actually be working with? So the population, definitely the hallmark of a good group is making it client-centric, right? So the, to better meet the needs of our clientele, you really should be able to adapt group content to be inclusive of certain specific populations. So for example, when Stephanie and I were working in methadone maintenance, we adapted our smoking cessation groups and our tobacco groups specifically to those people who were dealing with opioid dependency. And again, we found that this made it really tailored the program to their specific needs. And they were really able to identify and to relate to the content. So it wasn't just a tobacco or smoking cessation group. It was a smoking cessation group tailored for that, their particular needs. And there's a few groups to consider. I mean, certainly this is not an inclusive list. There's, there's definitely many other people on there that we could put on. But um, mental illness, um, diagnoses, clients with substance use disorders, seniors, um, the First Nation, Inuit and Métis population, youth, LGBTQ, the Francophone, and women are just, again, just some examples that you might um, want to consider. When and where. So definitely you want to look at where is the group actually going to be held. And some of the things you want to consider here is, one, is do you have proper space? Do you have adequate seating for people? Do you have adequate supplies? Uh, and also accessibility right, is another thing you want to consider. Are people able to access the wherever you're being held? Um, and so that's something you want to think about. Do you have enough big room? Usually, it's, hopefully, there's some kind of meeting room or big group room that you're offered in. Next, you also want to think about time of day. So I know in the past, when you try to run an early morning group, sometimes Monday morning, 
generally you don't tend to have the highest rates of people showing up. Um, same with when I tried to run a Friday afternoon group, that didn't go so well. <laughs> so uh, what we did actually was we put it out to our clients and we had them pick, we gave them a few options and we had them choose what day and time of day they would like. Uh, also length of session. So you want to consider how long is it going to be. Certainly if it's too short, there's not enough to, time to kind of get everything going, especially if it's a little bit of a larger group. And if it's too long, you might start to lose some people. So we tend to aim for about a 60 to 90 minute group, um, again, depending on the group and depending on the clientele you're working with. The length of the program, on average, when you look at the literature in this field, it tends to be somewhere between 8 to 12 weeks. So that's what we would recommend, and in our experience, that's worked relatively well, um, usually starting out with an 8-week group, although we have run some 12-week groups as well. And then you want to talk about breaks. So breaks in a smoking cessation or tobacco cessation group can be a little bit tricky. Reason for that is that they can be triggering, because sometimes when you take a break, you might have people who are tempted to go outside and go for a smoke. And certainly that's not what we want um, in a tobacco cessation group. We don't want to be triggering clients to smoke. One of the things that you can think about is what's called an uh, instant reset. And this came out of Stanford University. And this is where you give clients a break, but they stay within the room and you do something like a fun activity. So you might stand up and do like a little bit of a stretch break or jump up and down or a dance, just something that kind of gives them a break from the content, but doesn't actually have them go outside or just sort of stand around for 10 or 15 minutes. It's more of an active break. So that's something you might want to think about. And also you want to think about snacks. Um, so snacks, I always find that if you provide snacks, like if you feed them, they will come. <laughs> so um, sometimes that's a good way of getting people to want to attend your group. Um, although certainly you want to be offering a healthy snack where, where possible. You also want to think about cost and funding. So is there any cost to the client to attend your group? And this one also can be a little bit tricky. Um, we do know that sometimes when clients have to pay for something, they're more invested in it. And if they're more invested in it, they're more likely to show up. So that's something you want to think about. However, sometimes with our clients, they may not have the financial resources in order to attend a group. And you might not want to, you might want to sort of offer it at a free cost to the client. So sometimes if we did have clients paying for groups, it was really like a nominal fee, you know, $5 per group type of fee. It wasn't anything sort of excessive, and it was more just to help the client feel invested and committed. Um, I've also seen programs where they do give money back at the end of the program to the client um, if they've attended all of the groups. So again, it's another incentive for clients to keep coming. The other thing is you want to think about how much is it going to actually cost the agency. You know, you're going to have to look at the staff time. You might have to look at some resources. Um, so do you have that funding within your agency to be able to offer it? Also, where you might get funding. So you might be able to actually apply to various areas for funding or to go um, in your agency and request for, for funding for smoking initiatives. Where the, what can really help is having done your needs assessment beforehand and then being able to show that there's a really high need at your agency and taking those numbers and that data uh, to those who are involved in funding. And also you want to include a budget. So and this includes everything that I've talked about to date. So things like the location, if you have to rent space, things like snacks, things like resources, uh, anything that you might need to pay for, putting all that together. Lastly is recruit, or one of our last things uh, before I'll pass it to Stephanie is recruitment. So how are we actually going to get people to attend our group? So you're certainly going to want to promote your group. Um, and this can be in a variety of different ways. Some agencies have email listservs. Um, you'll certainly want to tell all your colleagues about it. You'll want to network with other agencies that might share you know, common uh, clients. You'll probably want to hang up things around the office, so putting things in your office, in the waiting room, um, hanging up little posters. You might want to connect with physicians, pharmacists, other community partners around how to refer clients to your smoking program. 
And then you want to consider how many participants are you taking at one time, what are your waiting lists going to look like, and things like that. Lastly. Is that lastly? Yeah. <laughs> lastly, okay. And lastly is our is evaluation. So you will want to look at, you will definitely want to gather some data on how your group is going. And I'm always big on evaluations because evaluations help us as clinicians know what went well and maybe what are some areas that we need to improve for our next go around. So we like to take, definitely I like to take um, evaluations at the beginning for what they're hoping for and what they're hoping to achieve at the end. And in some of our groups, we've also did a midpoint check-in. And it's a little bit more just to sort of see, are we on track with how they were hoping the group would go? What are some of the things that they want to see before the end of the group? And are we meeting um, their goals? You also want to be able to debrief. Um, so that would be something as well. At the end of the group, you want to get everybody together and just sort of see how did it go. Um, if you co-facilitated it, you and the co-facilitator should spend some time going through what worked, what didn't work so well, um, and maybe talking it over with another colleague or supervisor at the agency. Uh, again, looking at the evaluation piece. Always including a facilitator evaluation is also good. I know it's a little bit nerve-wracking sometimes to get that information, but really, again, that's how we learn and how we grow, so it's always good information to, to take. And certainly use of standardized assessments. Are you going to use any standardized tools, um, either beginning, middle, or end point? And then also stats, so publishing any of your statistics afterwards um, about how things went. That can also help, again, in future for, for funding. And now I'll pass it over to Steph. Thanks, Carolyn. So I'm actually noticing lots of great uh, questions in the chat box, so I'm actually keeping track of everything. And at the end of the session, we will uh, we'll come back to many of those questions. So thank you so much for all of your questions. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is curriculum and content. And what we'll cover in that is naming your group, defining a purpose, um, and then go through each phase, so the initial, midpoint, and final phase of the group, and some resources that you can utilize. So the first topic is naming your group. And it's often important to, uh, to come up with a catchy name. And what we would suggest, what we found to be really helpful when, when running our smoking cessation groups is to just kind of put on a generic smoking cessation group when promoting the group. But then when you get into the group on the first session, have the group come up with a name for their group. Because what that has been shown to, what that has been shown to do is create a sense of cohesion, and it really begins the the process of the group bonding or creating that group to, to gel together. The next thing you want to think about is the purpose of the group. So is this group going to be a harm reduction group? Is it going to be abstinence-based? Um, is it going to be kind of either or? Does it have to have one or the other? Um, so, you know, if you're thinking about harm reduction, is the purpose of the group to provide education around cutting back, cutting down on cigarettes? maybe switching to um, NRT or a nicotine inhaler, maybe an e-cig, switch the type of a cigarette going from a regular to a light, um, or is the end goal truly just that, um, that abstinence space where you are going to quit, where you come up with a quit date, and that's what it is. Um, so you want to have an idea of the philosophy behind the group prior to going in. Oftentimes that runs in conjunction with the philosophy of the agency that you're working at. So I just want to call the audience, um, and for those of you who are running groups, you can tell us about the group you're running, or for those of you who are planning to run a group, are you, would you create a harm reduction or an abstinence-based group for your organization? And some questions are, does it have to be either or, and, um, and what are the pros and cons of each? So thank you. And we'll cover those um, after we, we get through this content piece. So the next topic is developing the group. So we want to make sure that um, this really covers what this group is all about. What is the content? So you're, you have people, you have all the plans, you know how many weeks it is, um, and so what are we going to talk about over the next 12 weeks? 
Um, so research has shown that incorporating a number of elements, such as picking a quick date, developing a quick, a quick plan, coming up with triggers and coping skills, planning for relapse prevention, um, all really help that group be what the clients really want it to be. Um, so we're going to go through some of those in each of the phases of the group. So the first phase is the initial phase, and I would say this is probably the first um, one to three sessions, depending on how long your group is. But you want to make sure in the initial phase that you get through an introduction so the group starts to know each other. Oh, sorry, I didn't advance the slide. Um, so you really want to make sure that the group gets to know each other. You can do a fun icebreaker for that. You could do um, a fun little activity to get that, or you could just go around in a circle and talk through um, an introduction and maybe why someone came to the group. And the next thing is group norms. So group norms is really just the rules of the group. And, um, and we like to have the group come up with these. So the first session, have them brainstorm. You can write it on flip chart. You can put it on a PowerPoint slide. You can write it on the board if it's there. Um, but you want to cover such ideas, ideas such as confidentiality, um, respecting each other's group member, maybe ideas around punctuality or attendance. Um, and these are really important to set the foundation. So when we do talk about challenging situations that might arise, you'll see that group norms will really set a foundation to better let you handle the different challenging um, situations. So I will come back to group norms a little bit later. And then the next is the development of the group. So really making sure that you're getting that group to, to gel or creating that cohesion, because that's truly the magic of the group. That's when the group kind of becomes their own. And that usually happens, I find, in the first three sessions. In the first three, you do, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, making sure that you're throwing it out to the group and having the group work together. Um, and some topics that we might want to cover is, you know, why do you smoke, some reasons to quit or cut down, covering some myths and facts about quitting smoking, um, talking about the benefits of quitting, um, setting SMART goals, so what is a SMART goal, and then having each client set their goal, um, picking a quit date if that's the, the philosophy behind the group, and then, you know, assigning some homework. So, you know, maybe some tracking or creating a daily diary. So some resources for the initial phase. Um, many of these are teach resources, so you'll be able to find them. And we find many of them in the um, My Quit Plan book. I find that a fantastic uh, resource with, uh, to use with clients as an aid during each of the groups, um, especially the decisional balance, the readiness ruler, benefits of quitting smoking. It really sets a, a positive kind of a positive theme to the group where they can look forward to things. Um, and then the tracking card I also wanted to highlight. We, we found the tracking card phenomenal. I still use it with clients to this day. Um, we have one that, and I, I'm happy to share it with everyone. It's a, it's a little square and it actually fits the, the size of a cigarette pack. And it has 25 little boxes where you can mark and it allows you to have the, um, it allows you to put the time in and then kind of an emotion. So it uses very basic happy face, neutral face, and sad face that you can draw in. Um, and then you can track how many secrets you have because that allows clients and you as the therapist to be able to identify some patterns, maybe some of the triggers that the client might be facing. And that helps the client and the group to better plan for any triggers that might arise. So we find the tracking card or the tracking sheet a phenomenal tool. Then in the midpoint phase, you want to be covering, so again, depending on the length of your, your group, probably from three to six, I would say. Yeah. Um, it could go longer depending on the, the length of the group. Um, talking about pharmacotherapy versus NRT, so depending on when everybody is, um, has decided on their quit date, if that's the philosophy behind the group, you know, you can, you can start covering some education on pharmacotherapy or NRT. Um, if you're part of the STOP program through CAMH, then that's a really good way to provide the information before giving the STOP, uh, the NRT that might be available. Um, talking about positive support, so 
for the support. This group ends after a certain amount of time, so it can't be the sole support. So what are some supports that, that are out there? And having clients really identify those supports really helps them to, to buy into that process behind support. Um, Smokers Healthline offers phenomenal, phenomenal resources for support. So I really like to bring that up and provide a lot of information on Smokers Healthline because I find it phenomenal. Um, talking through cravings and withdrawal symptoms. So letting clients understand what the withdrawal symptoms might be and, um, and having a plan for cravings. Um, identification of triggers. So that's where that tracking card comes in really handy because after people have tracked, then you can identify as a group. So what are some common triggers? And then work through a group brainstorming. What are some coping strategies to those triggers? And then nutrition as well. So a lot of times, especially I find in certain populations, weight gain is a really big um, nervous factor when it comes to, to quitting smoking. So identifying some healthy snacks. You can even practice what you preach by, you know, having healthy snacks in each group if you have a budget for snacks. So instead of bringing Timbits, you could get some carrots or celery sticks or something like that. So you're really practicing what you preach and having that nutrition or that wellness element to the group. Um, we find people if that if that is something that makes them nervous, being able to talk through it as a group, see what helps for some people, that you can bring in myths about that because most people usually gain about five pounds when quitting smoking. So talking through that um, really helps to alleviate any of the anxiety around that. So again, just some resources for midpoint phase. The if I needed support, I would turn to that's in the My Quit Plan workbook. Um, again, Smokers Helpline, uh, Canada's Food Guide really helps to build upon that, um, that idea of nutrition. You could also bring in the plate. They have a divided plate where half of your plate is vegetables, a quarter protein, and a quarter carbohydrates. You could bring that in kind of as a tool, um, triggers and coping skills. You could do a worksheet. You could also do a um, kind of a brainstorm in the group and then have a worksheet or a handout for them after which has a summary of everything. Um, and Dr. Mike Evans has some phenomenal videos on YouTube. He's a physician who creates really accessible videos on health, and he has an amazing video called um, Quitting Smoking is a Journey. So being able to show that video, that actually gives you a lot of information about NRT, uh, pharmacology, as well as a lot of myths and um, truths about quitting smoking and really helps to normalize the, the relapse related with smoking cessation. So I like to show that video because it's, it's a fun little video. It's 12 minutes, but it's a, it's a really good overview of everything that we cover in midpoint phase. And then the final phase, this is the fun phase. So talking about relapse prevention and planning to work through relapse prevention, um, you know, thinking about the past relapse that may have happened if someone's had a quit attempt and it failed before. So talking through what that relapse was, actually going through what the actual scenario was and having a plan. You could utilize role play, which is always very helpful. Um, come up with a plan for maintaining success as a group. That's a really good way to get the group talking. Um, and then graduation. So Carol and I both love graduation. Uh, we call it we call it just like it's just like a really positive way to end end the group. So we have made little certificates and just saying like you know this person has, has quit the group, you can personalize it. You could also if they've met their goal, you can actually put the goal on the certificate. But recently what we found is at dollar stores, so I bought mine at Dollarama in, in the GTA, but I've seen them at many different dollar stores. They have these little, little trophies. I hope you guys can see. They're probably over the water. Yeah, that size. And they're gold. They have silver ones too, but they're tiny little plastic trophies. They're a dollar each. And we print out on the label the person's name. So at the end of the group, we give them a trophy. And it's just a really nice way to recognize the amount of work that it goes through attending the group, sharing in the group, and then 
making that huge lifestyle change. So it's a really great way. And it's a fun little thing that someone can put on their desk or they can keep in their home. And it's a visual reminder of the things that they learned in group. So if, you know, six, seven, eight months down the road, someone's feeling um, a little bit triggered or if they're struggling, then it allows them to kind of go back to the group and think, oh, okay, well, what are my supports? What helped me quit in the first place? So I find that's a really good tool to utilize. Um, and then termination. So termination and just going through the termination of the group, especially in the last few phases, um, it's useful for alleviating anxiety about the group ending. So, you know, reinforcing how great this group was, but then also starting to bring up the topic around, you know, groups, the, the group is going to end. So what are those supports? So going back to those supports, um, people are, uh, are really, they might be anxious about it. So making sure that they do have a plan for some positive supports in their life helps them alleviate any anxiety or termination. And then again, resources. So the relapse prevention worksheets. Um, and then again, the certificates or the trophies for clients. Got people using trophies. Yay, we have people using trophies. It's awesome. Aren't they fantastic? Um, other things you might want to consider is guest speakers. So I love using guest speakers because do you remember when we were back in school and you know you'd have a guest speaker come to you and it just, just felt like a fun. It was like having a movie in class. It was just so much more fun. So you know, bringing a pharmacist in if you're not already a pharmacist to to talk about. Um, pharmacotherapy or um, NRT, having people, having a physician come to speak, maybe a dietitian to really give a full talk about nutrition, social worker, having an elder. I'm sure this list is not exhaustive, but having many different guest speakers just helps to provide that extra little element. They don't have to run the entire group. If you're doing a 90-minute group, you can do 30-minute guest speaker and then an hour long after. Um, but we find that people love having um, guest speakers, and it just gives that added element to the group. Mm -hmm. And then booster groups or alumni groups I find are really helpful too, and it helps to also alleviate the anxiety about the group actually um, the group actually ending. So, you know, having someone come back in six months or eight months really builds that group co cohesion, but then it also keeps people accountable because they know that they're coming back to the group mm -hmm. in six to eight months. So I found that group really helpful. We do that for both, um, I do that for both smoking cessation groups and then I also run diabetes prevention program and we do booster, booster groups for both and we find them very, very helpful. And then I'm also seeing some people have um, peers come back. So someone who has um, quit smoking and come back to another group, that is really helpful because it gives you that lived experience and it really pulls up the experts in the group. So that's a fantastic topic. Thank you. So back to our poll. Have you been I've been keeping that? track. So it sounds like, which is great, a lot of people think that there's both, that there's room for both a harm reduction and abstinence, and that we could run either groups that sort of adopt both philosophies. Yeah. Or, um, and then I think that goes back to, which many people said, was about the needs assessment, right? It was looking at what kind of population you work with, because if you work with a population that, you know, harm reduction might be more beneficial, right, or might be yeah. a better starting point, whereas there's other, place, other groups where abstinence base might be more helpful. So I think you guys are, are definitely right um, in that there is really a place, I think, in tobacco cessation groups for both harm reduction and abstinence. So sometimes people just use them together, right? Yeah. So that you use it independent. Each person gets to decide their own, their own goal. Great. Thanks for your feedback, guys. So now this kind of gets us into the, the last part of our, of our um, presentation here, and this is on challenging situations. So these are, I guess this is the part that we really like, because Stephanie and I both always, whenever we've done webinars or training, one of the things we always crave is we want the real world stuff, right? So, you know, it's, it's one thing, like we know the theory and we just explained to you, we just went over a whole bunch of this theory about formulating groups and coming up with curriculum. But let's talk about the nitty gritty, right? Like, let's talk about how is it when we're actually with our clients in our group? What are the things that we're going to see? What are some of the challenges that we might encounter? And how do we actually, um, I guess, overcome some of these obstacles that we meet? 
So we'll take you through a few challenging situations, and we would love to hear from you guys as well in the um, chat box on how you might handle some of these clients and maybe what you've done in the past with some of these clients. My guess is you probably, uh, many of you have seen most of these clients we're going to talk about. These are all made up clients. So they are made up. Any, any um, what's the word I'm looking for? Resentment. Yeah. Is yeah. <laughs> not, is, is, that's all, yeah. Okay. So, Puppy and Paul. Puppy and Paul sits in the group and uses his e-cigarette throughout the session, often creating a cloud of smoke in the group. What do we do? <laughs> So we might have Puffing Paul. So generally the way that we would handle Puffing Paul is certainly going back to the group norms. And that's why Steph talked about group norms are so key, because you could talk about this before the group even starts. So are you guys going to allow e-cigarettes into the group? Um, and then if you are, you might want to maybe create breaks where you use e-cigarettes, or are you going to allow clients to sort of puff on their e-cigarette during the group? And that can sometimes be triggering for some clients. So you might say, let's say, if you talked about it and we, we or somebody brings it in, we haven't talked about it yet in group, you might say, Paul, you know, I respect your choice at having to use an e-cigarette. However, the smoke may be triggering um, for some people. And let's discuss how to handle e-cigarettes as a group. And I'm seeing in the chat box that, yeah, a lot of you guys have used group agent, or like the group norms, um, talking about group conduct, even the policy of the agency. So it uh, seems like we're all on the same page about dealing with talking Paul. <laughs> yeah. So then there's belligerent Bob. So belligerent Bob is angry to be in this group. He'll often sigh heavily after the after the facilitator makes a point, roll his eyes in an obvious manner. He has often challenged a number of group members, interrupting them, and sometimes shutting down their ideas. Oh, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so we've all probably had a Bob um, in our groups before, or we may encounter a Bob. So again, group norm, always. Um, we can go back to group topics of um, you know, respect, mutual respect ways of conduct um, within the group. Uh, we might also talk about, it as a, talk about it as a group. So I also find in many of these scenarios, the best thing to do as a facilitator is to throw it back to the group, right? Throw it back to the group on how it feels, you know, when, when Bob seems really upset or he seems disconnected from the group. And sometimes by putting it out to the group, not only can we go through and explore what's going on with Bob, um, but we can also validate his feelings and maybe provide opportunities or some support. And you might say to Bob, I mean, you could speak to Bob privately if it continues as a facilitator. Or you could kind of say to Bob, you know, it seems like, you know, you had a really strong reaction, Bob. Could you tell me your thoughts about that? Or could you share a little bit more with the group on what you're feeling? And I'm seeing the chat box, too. This is great. So, you know, taking Bob aside and reminding him of the group guidelines, why he's there, but then also bringing it back to smoking. So perhaps hit the belligerence or the anger might be um, because he, you know, he's on edge. Maybe he's having some withdrawal symptoms. So offering NRT, mm -hmm. if that's the case, that's a great point. And, uh, and another one is asking Bob if he has something positive he wants to share mm -hmm. with the group. So, you know, taking mm -hmm. it away from the negative and putting it on the positive, I think those are great answers. Yeah, yeah. So thanks, guys. Now we're going to talk about Mike. So Mike is monopolizing mm -hmm. Mike. And he takes over the group, so he's often interrupting the facilitator, other other clients. He's constantly bringing each topic back to himself, or bringing the group off topic. So going off on a tangent. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, we need to we need to get Mike in track. <laughs> yeah, this one can be a tricky one, I think, for facilitators because on one hand we want to allow our participants to share and that's and encourage participation. But on the other hand, we don't want we want everybody to participate, and we don't want one person to take over. So, how do you effectively stop somebody from monopolizing the group without hurting their feelings and with sort of validating their their experiences? So, oftentimes, it's taking what that person is saying, so what Mike might be saying, and directing it to the group. You know, so Mike, it sounds like you actually you went through quite a lot this week. Let's talk. Let's put it out to the others now and see if they've gone through a similar experience. 
another way you can do it is, you know, I like where you're going with that, but I'm going to stop you right there because I want to hear what others have to say about what you brought up. So really validating the points that Mike's making, but using that opportunity to have a conversation with the group can often make him feel validated and feel like a really valued member of the group so you're not cutting him off, but that you're also, you know, encouraging conversation within the group. Yep, absolutely. So I'm seeing in the chat box, thanking them for sharing their opinion and stating that you can address their concerns after the group so everyone has a chance to contribute. So that's another great one. Um, and yeah, again, bringing it back to those group norms to include equal time for all. Yeah. All right. Silent Sandy. Silent Sandy sits in the back and only speaks when spoken to, often with a one-word response. Sandy, so definitely you want to try to encourage participation and encourage engagement as much as possible. Um, hopefully, again, going back to the group norms, that the goal is for to try to encourage people to participate as much as possible. Um, at the beginning or the end of group, you might want to connect with Sandy one-on-one um, -on -one just to see how Sandy is doing, if there's any issues, concerns, or anything like that, or any ways that you could maybe increase Sandy's comfort. Sometimes I find like doing a little small activity, so you might do like a pair and share activity, might help encourage Sandy to feel, you know, comfortable to participate or engage. Uh, you can encourage people that there are no wrong answers. And you might say, I mean, you might try, depending on your style, you might try to say to Sandy, you know, Sandy, what, how, how has it been for you this week? Um, as a way of trying to encourage her to participate. Yeah, and you know, having that, that beginning and the end of the session really helps to um, create that sense of comfort. So maybe Sandy, this is her first group, maybe this is her first time at the agency that you're working at or the organization and she's really nervous, maybe she has some other issues that might be going on. So um, being able to touch base with her one-on-one -on -one can really help yeah. increase her comfort level. And then I find too, oftentimes, that pair and share. So mm -hmm. having people break into separate groups, that's really helpful because sometimes it's nerve-wracking to talk with a group of 12, but when you have one person beside you, you might feel a little bit more comfortable. Yeah. And then let's go back to the chat box. So, um, so maybe Sandy. Yeah, so Sandy might be depressed or has other issues such as abuse, um, splitting the group session into one-on-one -on -one for the first half hour and full group for the remainder of the time, so that might bring Sandy out of her session, and then using props such as paint chips, you can select to present how they are feeling. Guidelines also state that they can pass. Oh, that's great, too. Mm -hmm. Thanks, really guys. good suggestion. So next is attacking Anne. So she can be insulting to other group members, questioning each item the facilitator brings up, not supportive of the other group members, putting down their opinions, or can be judgmental of others' struggles. So again, really bringing the group norms up yeah. and attacking and making sure that group norms cover this, this topic, um, using this opportunity to explore the feelings behind the anger or attacking of group members. Um, you know, often you'll have to validate the feeling, but reminding the group of respecting other group members. And if it does become worse, you want to make sure that you are keeping the best needs of the group at at the forefront, mm -hmm. so you might need to bring Anne aside and talk to her individually. And then if there is a conflict in the group, debrief him privately after the group between the two group members that may have been affected. Um, and then having the group process the conflict together. And then an example, you can say, you know, Anne, I see you have a strong opinion on that. I want to remind the group of the importance of respecting each other's opinions and journeys. Mm -hmm. That's a really neat thing, I think, again, that magic of the group cohesion. Once you have the group and it's gelling, you can really put a lot of it back to the group. So anytime you get these challenging situations, you really can put it out to the group and see how the group feels or how the group wants to process that. Right? So how does it feel when Anne is bringing up some of these, you know, what, what she's saying, some of these insults or the questioning each time somebody brings something up? How does that make everybody feel? And then processing that out and validating where it's coming from with Anne, which is important. Yeah, and you really do want to nip it in the bud. You really mm -hmm. want to make sure that that is taken care of early on in the group, so the first time it happens or the second time, because you need to make sure that the group members do feel safe. Of course. So late Lucy, 30 minutes into the group, and Lucy just arrived. Oh, Lucy. <laughs> so again, group norms do affect, can address this. 
um, some individuals may not understand how this can affect the group. If it becomes a recurring problem, you can bring up group norms again. You know, you can, it's, it's always often a good practice to bring up the group norms at the beginning of each session or have it there and just kind of point to it. So people do have that reminder. Group is one and a half hours of an entire week. So oftentimes we can forget about those things when we have 946 other things going on mm -hmm. in our life. Um, if it is a problem and is being really disruptive to the group, um, speaking to the person individually after the group, offering assistance if necessary, um, because you know sometimes maybe there's a barrier for her getting to group on time. Maybe there's a later group that she can attend instead. So you know being able to brainstorm with her because she's missing out too, and you want to make sure that she's getting the full effect of the group. So um, an example that you could say. Yeah, you could decide how you want to like just allow the person to come in and join the group, or you might want to say something like, you know, glad that you made it here safely, or was it difficult getting in today, or come, you know, welcome, come join us. And then you might want to put it back to the group, um, you know, about the group norms, and again, talking about lateness. Or I find sometimes if it's happening quite frequently, not just with Lucy, but with other clients, maybe at midpoint or a few weeks in, you want to take a little bit of time at the beginning of group to just address the idea of lateness and see how it's been affecting the group, right? And see if, it, if, again, putting the question out to the group, if it's bothersome, if it's disruptive for some people. And sometimes that just brings some awareness and brings it home a little bit for people that, oh, yeah, I need to make you know, a better effort at getting here on time. Tony Therapist. So Tony Therapist assumes the expert role He's tried everything that has been suggested and frequently prescribes treatment plans to other group members. Oh, Tony. Uh, so definitely, again, we're big believers in um, respecting the experience within the room and that clients are experts in their own lives. So certainly we want to encourage contribution and we want to hear from, from clients about what has been helpful for them. Um, but we need to also be careful that their journey is their journey, not not necessarily what worked for them might not work for somebody else. So we want to also put it back that that might be their opinion or their thought or their experience and remind them of that. Um, and again, they're their expert in their lives, but not everybody else's life. And what works for them might work not work for somebody else. So I might want to say, you know, your comments have been helpful. Thank you. Now let's see how others may tackle that issue. Yeah. Yeah, let's keep it an eye on the time. Mm -hmm. um, so interrupting Ivan, he never waits his turn, cutting off group members, guest speakers, and the facilitator multiple times per session. So, I mean, definitely interrupting Ivan. So anytime when you have clients or participants interrupting always within the group, it can be disruptive, certainly. Um, and it can impact the flow of discussions. It can kind of make other people feel like their points aren't valid or that they're not able to get out their thoughts. So again, I'm sure we're broken records here, but we want to bring it back <laughs> to the group norms, right? You want to be able to address that right away. Um, you also might want to say something to Ivan like, you know, Ivan, it sounds like you have something really important to say. Let's just let, you know, Stephanie finish and uh, her thought and then we'll come back to you. And I'm loving this, having a parking lot for who can talk next. Yeah. So that's a great point. Sorry for rushing, we just want to make sure we get them all in before mm -hmm. the end of time. Um, resistant Rebecca. So Resistant Rebecca feels forced to attend group, doesn't think that group therapy is effective, and is unwilling to implement any strategies that are suggested. So she's not happy to be in the group. No. So some topics that you could bring up or something you could do is, you know, validate that she's feeling forced to attend, ask if others have had similar experience being forced into something they didn't want to do, and share similar experience on, on how they handled it, or exploring what she could get out of the group. So maybe it's not something that she feels, um, maybe she doesn't want to quit smoking, but maybe there is something that she can get out of the group. So again, bringing it back to that positive side. And then something you could say to her is, it sounds like you feel like you have no choice in coming to group and you're feeling angry. Who else has had similar experiences and how did you handle that mm -hmm. situation? And with Rebecca, it really reminds me of like, am I approach it. Yeah, big time. Right, big you know, time. feeling, rolling with resistance, right, that whole idea of not kind of fighting and conflicting with resistance, but allowing it to happen and just kind of rolling with it and working within that resistance. And then when you're talking through it, with, when you're rolling with that resistance, you might be able to pull out some of that change talk and identify some of that change talk. 
Exactly. So the last thing we just wanted to talk about really briefly is managing conflict in the group because sometimes you will see some conflict in the group. So identifying that I think we do sound like a broken record <laughs> that group terms are paramount. Um, but you want to really have the group resolve conflict first together. So the group terms truly set that foundation and they always give you something to come back to. Um, and it really sets that the, the scene, right? If you if you come back to group norms at the beginning of each session, people do understand that it is a very respectable place to be. Um, have the group try and resolve the conflict first together, but understand that, and this can be nerve-wracking if it's your first few times running a group, but you will need to take a more active role when needed. So, you know, talking to the group member individually, or you might need to facilitate more in the group, and then if that's not working, talking to the group member individually before or after group will be required. So questions, we're going to, we've been keeping track of some of the questions, so we wanted to, in the last two minutes that we have, um, touch base on some of the questions. So do you have a list? I do have a list here. So we have one question, what if one person's negative comments set off other members and that gathers momentum? Mm -hmm. That's a great big, question. Big challenge, certainly. And I think, I mean, again, that's sort of the, the key. I mean, definitely you don't want one person's upset now to cause sort of a whole situation within the group and everybody getting upset. So I think that's where sometimes as a facilitator you might have to take on a little bit more of an active role in those situations. And again, putting it out to the group, right? you might have to sort of stop the group a little bit and sort of say, okay, I'm sensing that there's a lot of negativity or that we're all quite upset about this particular issue. How do we want to handle that as a group together? Right? And that could look like a whole bunch of things. I mean, it might end up being coming an activity where you write things out on the board. Maybe people want to sit silently and put some thoughts together. Maybe you do want to take like an instant recess where you'll do like sort of a stretch break or a little dance break to kind of break up the feeling in the room. Um, or you want to process that as a group and you want to put it out together and, and go through it. And I think that's, that's the way. And again, going back to those norms, it's just sort of saying, you know, I'm sensing that we're getting a little bit off track here from our, our norms about, you know, not being judgmental or not being negative or whatever it might be and bringing it back to the group. And I'm seeing, um, I think it's Sienna, you asked for a book of notes and tips. So we'd be happy to mm -hmm. put something together. And yeah, well. Tanya, would we be able to send, I don't know if Tanya's on the line, um, but would we be able to send everything to you or Parazad maybe so we could share? And then maybe we could even, because of time, um, answer a bunch of these questions and email it back so everyone that we have answers to all the questions? Yeah, for sure, Stephanie. Um, okay generally do that after each webinar, so for sure I'll gather all the questions at the end and send them off to you and uh, whatever notes